it's so amazing that when you experience it, you realize that you can't do it on your own. And so he does it for he does it for you um, as believers. You know, the, our whole purpose as a church is to um, help people find and develop a relationship with Christ. Uh, we're, we're not playing with that. We want people to develop a relationship with Christ, not a relationship with just blessed kingdom ministries, but a relationship with the Lord. And as, as believers, you know, as we begin the growth process as a Christian, um, you begin to realize the extent of what Jesus did. Even when you accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, you really don't realize it all. Uh, you, you have a superficial understanding, but it's in your heart to where you accept God. But there's a change that happens in you as you start to really realize what God has done for us, what Jesus has done for us. And you realize that, that, that you have your family, you have your brothers and sisters in the world, but you literally become brothers and sisters in Christ. Meaning we got each other's back. Meaning if you hungry, I'm hungry. If I'm hungry, you, you want to feed me. And if, if you're hungry, I want to feed you. I want to make sure you're taken care of. You want to make sure I'm taken care of. Isn't that how we work, family? We really are concerned about each other. If, 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 if I've got water uh, leaking in my house, it's leaking in your house also. You know, me and, me and uh, Elder Medina, before he was an elder, um, he, uh, you know, we had some, I had some work that needed to be done at my house where I needed a step because, you know, when you, you know, everybody was in Bible study back then. We used to have Bible study at my house. And when you come out of Bible study, it was dark time. And if you're not paying attention, you could step off the long, that, that high curb I had, because it was, it was supposed to be a step in between there, but it was just a high curb. I mean, it was about this high. And if you stepped out, you may meet Jesus <laughs> that evening. And, and, and so, um, you know, we had, we had this, uh, we, we had this idea. We said, hey, let's, uh, does anybody know how to put a step up, you know, put a, a, add an extra step in there? And Elder Medina, you know, told me, hey, man, yeah, I can do it. And uh, he came with his wood and did everything and put the concrete. And we had me lifting those heavy bags of those heavy bags of concrete. And um, then we got out there and he put it up together and, and poured the concrete and did everything. And it's about halfway through where he told, you know, well, I'm like, man, this is looking good. He was like, you think? Yeah. And, and then he basically told me, he's like, yeah, this is the first time I'm doing this. <laughs> so you're trying it out on my step? <laughs> <laughs> needless to say it came out well <laughs> it came out very good and it still works today by the way and uh, but it's the lord it's amazing how the lord works i mean he knew the he had the idea in his hand in his head and he just came forth and did it and uh, it blessed us because we were able to get something done that 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 cost us next to nothing and and so i i just know that as brothers we that we literally become brothers and sisters in christ we want to help each other we want to be successful. And you realize that. You realize that that's even more powerful than the natural. And Jesus talked about that, said, these are my brothers. These are my mothers. These are my sisters. You know, and, and then you begin to understand what he was talking about. Oh, why? We really care about each other. We really want what's best for each other. And so the more mature Christians, uh, the, the more mature Christians, we then be you know, as brothers and sisters in Christ with the young and the old. I'm talking about Christianity, not young in age, but young in Christianity and the older in Christianity. We become accountable to helping the new ones become true disciples because a disciple is one who follows the teachings. And so in Christianity, a disciple is one who follows the teachings of Christ. And so it's our duty, we want, as you come in and accept Jesus, we want you to follow the, 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 the teachings of Christ. We want you to become a disciple. Why? Because Jesus told us to do that. And so when we come to services like this, we don't want you to have a bunch of raw, raw services where you think you know something, but understand nothing and are not following the Lord. We don't want you to come in here and think you're following the Lord. We want you to come in here and what? Know you're following the Lord. You can know that every time you come here, you are following the Lord. And so we are here to 
make sure that you understand the true good news and assist in making disciples out of you. That's what we're here to do. We're not just here to give you a great service and all that other stuff. We're, we're here to, to help you to understand the, the truth and the good news and assist in making disciples out of you. Why that? That's because Jesus called us to do that. Let me read Matthew 18, uh, 28, verse 19 and 20. Here's what he says to his disciples. Therefore, go and make what? Disciples. Of all nations. We got all nations in here. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. As surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. He didn't say go and have great services. He didn't say where everybody's screaming and crying. He didn't say have elaborate shows where everybody's admiring the concert that you're having. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm to make you a disciple. And so we're supposed to make disciples and we're supposed to teach them to obey, not just invite people to church, but if they accept the Lord, now you got to teach them and show them how to obey the Lord. And that is the amazing thing about it. When that person becomes a true disciple, when they're obeying God, when that, that new person is obeying God, guess what they are supposed to do after they understand and they're, they're plugged into church and they're plugged into doing the things of God? Guess what they're supposed to do? Exactly. They're supposed to repeat the process. Repeat the, this is what we do. This is how the numbers increase. We repeat the process over and over again. We make disciples and then they make disciples out of somebody else. And so you le learn to become uh, active in coming to services uh, you know, because the scripture says, don't forsake the fellowshipping, don't forsake getting together and fellowshipping. And then you learn to read and understand the ways of Jesus to be the example of Christ that you're supposed to be. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to all be an example of Christ. And so you make available to others to hear the message. We're not just supposed to come to church. It's not just about you. When you come to church, you're supposed to learn so that you can apply it when you're out there, when God brings somebody to you so you can share about church and invite them. And then they come and guess what? You, you, they've accepted Jesus and then your work begins. Amen. Now you got to make them a disciple because what happens? What happens when, when you accept Jesus and then you start coming to church? Well, eventually what's going to happen? You'll stray away. Anybody ever strayed away from church before? Everybody was a disciple and everything worked perfectly and you were doing everything. No, that's not how it works. You stray away and guess who's supposed to help you come back? That person who brought you. Supposed to make a disciple out of that person. And so you don't, you know, we understand that you don't have to be a pastor, but you do have to be a vessel. Does everybody understand that? And so I want us to get this clearly because every time we come here, we don't come here just to learn. We come here to learn and apply to our lives and to other people's lives. And so uh, as you grow, you grow to fear nothing but God himself. Look, look, now we fear the things that are going on in the world. We get scared of all, but no, no, no. As you grow, you learn to fear God alone. Not all the, the chaos that's going on in the world because the chaos that goes on is because of sin. And so we're not in fear of sin. We're only in fear of who? God. And so uh, because as you grow, you start to understand the magnitude of what has been done for us. What has been done for us and nothing uh, in our lives is more powerful than what Jesus has done. And as you accept Jesus, you're excited about that, but that doesn't mean that nothing's more powerful. But as you start to grow, as you start to learn, as you start to apply the word to your lives, you start to begin to understand that nothing is more, empo more empowering and nothing is more powerful than what Jesus has done. So let's study and, and, and clearly understand today why uh, we should give up everything for Jesus. It's like, what is give up everything? Give up everything. You should turn. 
What is turn? Well, what does it mean? Uh, give up sin. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean? Because we've all came from a life of sin, but we don't understand what sin is. And you don't understand it completely until you start reading and applying and coming to learn about Jesus. Anybody ever been in major debt before? Anybody in here ever been in major debt before? None, none of y'all have had them callers happening. Some of y'all. Some, yeah. Yeah, uh, where you owed a significant, <laughs> somebody said, I'm still. <laughs> but anybody ever been there where you have that uh, significant amount of money that you owe? And then you get mad at people who call you. They calling you because you owe. <laughs> but you mad at them for calling you. Like, why are you calling me? <laughs> and so we are rightfully guilty. Can I get amen? Some of y'all in your households? Yeah. <laughs> some, of y'all, <laughs> some of y'all run. <laughs> You know, you're rightfully guilty, but still don't like them calling you. Like, you get mad, you, you, you block their number. Hey, the nerve they have to call me over the stuff I owe. <laughs> Isn't that what happened? <laughs> That's what happens to all of us. We, am I the only one been there before? And I know none of you have probably been in that situation where you've owed before, because everybody here probably has good credit because y'all operate and, and do godly for your godly things and, and do things right and everything's in order. Am I, am I correct? Or are we all heathens and have done things wrong before and have, uh, have borrowed more than we could spend? <laughs> and so um, I'm only speaking to those who are guilty of that, uh, who have done that before, who have had that significant amount of uh, money that you've owed or or credit or whatever you've done. And how many of you have ever disguised your voice when they call? <laughs> As if they know you. Larry, no here. <laughs> like, why did I do that? You know what? You, you wonder why you do stuff like that. But you, how many people raise your voice? Oh, no, he's not here right now. Like, they don't, they don't, they don't even know you. But we do that. We change. We change. We we act like we're not here. No, I'm not. I mean, they're not here. You know, we do those things. And um, it's crazy because we act as if sometimes we don't even speak English. (laughs) I know. So they won't call no more like they don't know you are you. And so you get mad because you don't want them to call you anymore. But the real question is, were you guilty of creating the debt? And the answer would be, everybody say, resounding, yes. We're all guilty of it. And most of the time, the answer is yes. And so um, that's how we are when we don't know God. He created the world. He revealed himself to us, but we rejected him, and we still do when we don't know him. We reject him and avoid him because of our guilt. That's what happens. You know, the the creditor is, is not wrong to call us for calling us, but because we're guilty, and we don't, we don't, we're, we're not available. We don't have the availability. We have the availability to spend the money, but not, but not the availability to pay, pay it back. We're guilty. And so we don't want to answer to them because we don't have the means to take care of that problem that we've created. And, and so the same thing happens in Lord. What happens is because we're guilty of things we don't even know we're guilty of, we try to avoid him and we don't want him in our lives because he tries to tell us right. He tries to tell us what we've done wrong. We're like, we don't want to hear from you. Stop calling. Larry, no here. We try to act like we don't know, we don't want to know who he is, and we stand on the ground that he created, and we breathe the air that he supplies. And we try to say, well, I don't believe there is. I don't believe in this. I don't believe it. The fact is, you do believe. You just don't want to believe because he tells you right from wrong. And so when he and so 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 we understand that this Bible, you can understand it superficially, but it tells us that we've sinned. And we don't want to be told that we've done something wrong. We don't want to be told that we owe something. We don't want to be told that we're responsible. 
And so how, how do we do that? How do we sin? Well, he tell you know, the basics of it, we don't have to read all the 613 laws to know what sin is. We can just go off the basic ones. He tells us not to lie. How many people have lied before, even to the creditors? Yeah. He tells us not to commit adultery. He tells us not to steal. He tells us not to murder. But everything in us makes us want to do those things. Anybody guilty of those thoughts? And the only, only one of those things are the things that commit us to separation against God. One of them. If you, not, not if you told multiple lies, but told one lie. And so we understand that you may not have murdered anybody, but the scripture says murder happens in your heart first. Murder, first you think, if you, just to think about it. The scripture says if, you, if, you, if you're being, uh, you know, in so many words, if you're distant or hating your brother, that's murdering them. So we may not murder nothing in, uh, somebody in the world, but how many people have murdered somebody before in their hearts? So it makes us all guilty. Elder Medina, I want to know why you held up two hands. <laughs> he said you did it twice. <laughs> so one of those things can separate us from God. And look at your neighbor and say, we're all guilty. And so the, the, the thing is, is I'm not here to condemn you. I'm not here to make you, you feel bad or anything like that. We're all guilty. We've all done things wrong. And none of us can be made right by any of our acts of kindness, no matter how much money you give to the church or how many times you've helped the church out, how many things you've done right. It doesn't make you right with God. And so once you understand that, you're like, oh, man, I need to get myself right. What is, what is getting yourself right? That's what you have to understand. What is getting yourself right? Because nothing you can do on this earth can make you right. And so if there's no fix for us, for all those violations that we did, what is the fix? What is the fix to making us right? What is the fix to making us right, walk in the right direction? What is the fix to helping us restore our relationship with God? Because, you know, you don't want, you don't want a, a friend to be against you. You definitely don't want God to be against you. He's the creator of all things. And so why would you want, you don't want him to be against you. And so the, the, the main thing, and, and, and it's, it's, it's amazing because a lot of times, you know, people reject Jesus because they don't understand what he's done. They don't understand who he is. They don't understand what, 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 what his purpose was. And so I want you to understand it today so that when you make a decision, you make a decision to either accept or deny who God is. One or the other. Amen. So what happened was what they call the incarnate word. That's the word of God, the word of God, the God almighty was made flesh. He was made into a human and he came down to this earth to live as one of his created humans. He created us, but then to save us, he came down to live as one of us. And so that God made flesh, did that so that his father in heaven, so that his father, the father who, who controls all, can direct the punishment that was owned by us upon his son who did nothing wrong. All those lies you've told, all those things you've done wrong, all those people you've treated wrong, all the rejections you had against God were paid by one person. And so it's a simple solution. God, the son says, those who believe in him by faith, they are saved. And so it's simple. It's like, is that, is that easy? I just believe in him? Well, it's that easy, but it's that complex. He said, those who, 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 who believe in him by faith, they are saved. It's that easy. We're saved. We have eternal life because of our faith in God, our faith in Jesus. Yeah. But it also says those who do not believe are still condemned by sin. Well, well so even after I have accepted Jesus, I told a lie like the person down the street who told a lie. But the difference is I believe in Jesus and my sins have been paid. But that didn't make sense to me. 
That did, you know, I want to understand more about that. And so it's a simple point. You don't have to understand it, but you just have to believe it. And not believing it doesn't make it any less true. We always say it's light outside, right? If you believe that it was dark and you still walk outside, is it going to be dark? It's not an eclipse anymore. What's it, what's good, what's it going to be? Light. Why? Because your, your, your faith in, in, in non-belief doesn't change the facts. And so God gives us facts. We either choose to believe them or choose to deny them. But our denying them doesn't make them any less true. And so it's a simple point. And we want to get you to the point where you can believe it, because once you believe it, this is what we're here to share with everybody. We want to share with you what happens after you accept Jesus. What happens? How? What change happens in your life to, to, to take you in the right direction? And so what happens when we truly accept the son? Paul explains this in the book of Rome, Romans chapter five. So we want to understand this by the time we leave. The whole purpose of us coming to church is not everybody be jumping around and screaming, but for everybody to understand what we're going over today. Amen. So we want you to understand this. And so Paul explains it in chapter five here. He explains um, what we're about to talk about here. So um, we want people to know the truth so that you can either make a choice to accept him or deny him. So at this, uh, in this short 21 verses we're reading this morning, he explains from Adam to Jesus. And so Paul is addressing these sophisticated believers in, in the Roman church. And this is what he says. He's talking about clarity here. He says, therefore, this is chapter five, verse one and two. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. Wow. So this is simple. Since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we spoke last week about um, God's giving us access to the Holy of Holies. And um, we uh, were talking about how people uh, were struck dead in the Old Testament by just wrongfully touching a place where they're not supposed to touch uh, on the Ark of the Covenant. And, and, and well, those, those people who believe in Christ, the people who believe in Christ now, we can have comfort that, uh, and I want to read this, that God just, God's justice towards us were was eternally sac satisfied and what follows that is peace what am i saying i'm saying if the ark of the covenant was right here and somebody was walking with the ark and you touched it as a child of god there is no death because you have now access to god so many people got struck dead so many people died because of that but you have access to God. You, you can go there with your shoes on. You can go there with, with, your, with, the, with your dress on. You can go as you are before the Holy of Holies. Why is that? Because you're holy? No, because you're made holy through Jesus. And so those who believe can have comfort that you're eternally made holy through Jesus. Now, well, yeah, how, how, how do we bring that example of peace now? Well, the example of peace now is those creditors we were talking about. What happens when you've paid off all your debts? You start answering your phone more, right? And then what happens? Why? Because you got peace now. You're not worried about who calls you. And so the same thing happens in the Lord. Once you understand what Jesus has done for you, you are not walking in the arrogance of this world. You're walking in the assurance of God. You start to understand who you are in Christ and understand, yes, you will go through things, but you have Jesus as your Lord. And so 
when you know your eternal purpose is secured and someone has answered to God for you, you can go to the Lord as a child of God instead of going to him as a child of sin. See, normally as a child of sin, we only pray to God when we need things. They're like, God, please help us. Can we pray? You ain't prayed in 10 years. But you want to pray when you're in a hospital with somebody. You say, hey, can we pray? But you haven't been chasing after God. You haven't been following God. You haven't been doing anything that has to do with God. So you go to God as a child of sin. But when you understand who you are in Christ, you know that the prayers of the righteous avail. You know that as a child of God, you it's not based on all the things you've done wrong. It's based on what he's done right. And when you pray, you pray with that faith instead of the, the, the non-assurance of a person who doesn't know God. And so Paul is saying that you have, everybody say me, have been justified by faith in Jesus. And now you have access to the Father and you have access to him sinless. When you go before the father, he doesn't see the, the, the nasty words you said yesterday. He doesn't see the bad things you've done. He doesn't see the, the, the uh, how you were with your husband or how you were with your wife. He doesn't see all of that stuff. He sees Jesus. And when you go before him, you, you want to go as, as a righteous child. Well, you go as a righteous child thinking about what the Lord has done, not about what you have done. And so this is what Paul says also. He says, and we boast in the hope of the glory of God. You boast now, you begin to brag now, you begin to boast because now you have purpose. You understand that your life has purpose. How many people have said before, I don't know who I am or where I'm going or what I've done, or I don't know if I'm going in the right direction. Well, now you know, because you have chosen Jesus as your Lord and as your savior, and you have faith in his purpose for your life. And so now you boast about that because you have purpose. And that hope is more, uh, it's not really talking about the general hope we talk about. It's talking about like a, a happy certainty where we know that we know that we know that God has saved us. And so verse three says, not only so, but we also glory in, the, in our sufferings. Uh-oh, what does that mean? Children of God will suffer. Has anybody been to church? We say, oh, you're not going to suffer anymore. No, you're going to suffer. <laughs> Pastor told you you're going to suffer. You will suffer because of the word of God. You will suffer because you're trying to change from one person to another person. You will suffer. You will have struggle. You have challenges. There will have all kinds of things that will test your faith. What did we say before? There's no victory without a battle. And so if you want a victory, how many of you, are, how many sang the song, got victory in Jesus? Well, then you in a battle. You want a victory, you got to have a battle. There's got to be challenges. Faith is only faith be when you go through tests of unfaith. And so it says, verse three, not only so, but we also glory in the sufferings because we know that suffering Produces what? <laughs> Perseverance, character, and character hope. And so if you, if you look at the details of those words, it says, in glory, glory in our sufferings. That's the first thing it says. Now, everybody might not know what sufferings are. Or those are the things you stress about. The things you stress about day in and day out, the things you stress about now, now, and what it's saying is now those things produce perseverance. So when you stress about things, when you stress about the things of God, now it says now those things pro produce perseverance. Why? Because your focus is not the things. Your focus is who? Jesus. And so we, we suffer in this world every day without God but there's no eternal purpose. Now, as a child of God, you will suffer, meaning you will go through trials and tribulations. I want you to repeat after me. I will, I will go, through go through trials, trials and tribulations. tribulations. And you know what it makes you want to do? Call another brother and sister in Christ. What it makes you want to do in the flesh? Ignore your brothers and sisters in Christ. 
That's what we do. But it doesn't make you any less saved. Salvation is the main thing. And so we suffer in this world every day, but the difference is there is no eternal purpose. Every dollar that you make doesn't make give you an eternal purpose. Everything that you do doesn't give you an eternal purpose. Now, when you suffer, meaning go through trials and tribulations, as you learn about God, your suffering is not in vain because you're on the right team. And so what happens is you... You, you, you trust that there's a purpose behind all your suffering, all the things you go to. You know, think about it. You know, I always talk about when I used to go to the club and do all the things I did. Well, the, 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 the challenges back then were, whole, uh, were different challenges. But as I changed, here's the thing. I gave my life to Christ, but I still went to the club. Does anybody understand what I'm talking about? I, I didn't, you know, I, I was still there. <laughs> like, Lord, I, I trust you, but I'm going out tonight. None, none of y'all have ever done that. Y'all, y'all perfect, right? Everything works perfectly for y'all. Y'all, uh, let me say, let me, let me help you with this. You gave your life to Christ, but you still curse. Huh? 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 You gave your life to Christ, but you still screaming at folks. That's the same thing as going to the club. You gave your life to Christ, but you still have problems with your husband or your wife. No, no, like, <laughs> you you gave your life to Christ, but you still haven't forgiven. You still operate in unforgiveness. That's what I'm talking about. That's what happens to us. And so you, but but the difference is you've given your life to Christ and you trust that there's a purpose in everything. And then you understand that if you stop cursing, it's not you who's doing it, it is God that's working within you. If you learn to forgive, you understand it's not you because in your old thing, you can harbor anger, but now you're harboring the love of God. And you get excited because the main thing is done, meaning that you have been saved. It's, it's not, it's, there, there, there are no take backs in this. You, you know how you are. You, you, you give somebody something, and then you borrow it back. And then you keep it because it was yours in the first place. None of y'all did that. None of y'all did that before. Can I borrow my line more? <laughs> because your your new one broke. Now you want your old one back. No, none of y'all have ever, you know, none of y'all have ever taken anything back, or none of y'all have ever, you know, uh, um, not done what you said you were going to do. And so the good thing about God is He doesn't change His mind. He doesn't change His mind. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So this is what verse five says. It says, and hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. And so what does that mean? The moment you believed in Jesus, you are given the Holy Spirit as a guide. You begin to become aware of God and that awareness gives you joy. And that joy is given by the Holy Spirit. The reason that we get more excited, even in the midst of our trials and turmoils and things that we go through, is because the Holy Spirit, and some people, you know, the Holy Spirit is working in our heart, and sometimes we're trying to figure out, well, I don't know if I have the Holy Spirit. Well, do you believe? If you believe you have the Holy Spirit, stop, stop listening to what the devil tries to say to you and understand that you have the Holy Spirit the moment you believe. And that's the thing that starts working at you. Like it worked on me. And I was like, man, before I used to love going to the club. Then when I went after I said I was not going to go anymore and I still went, I didn't feel the same anymore. I started straying and said, man, why do I even want to be here? I don't even want to go here no more. And so you, start to, you start to understand that something's working in you and you don't understand what it is if you don't study the word of God. Then you start understanding, oh, it was you all this time. You were the one drawing me. You were the one who drew me not to drink. You were the one who drew me not to smoke. You were the one who drew me away from the club. And so you become, you, you, what happens is you begin to become aware of God. I told you as a, as a young man, I would get down on my knees and pray to God and read his scripture and read his, didn't know why. I would just do it every time I got home from work. And now I understand it was the Holy Spirit working within me that got me to do that. And that makes me have joy. That's the joy we're talking about. And that happy certainty that you get in the Lord makes you boast even more. 
Not about the things you overcome, but about the overcomer. And so you become excited. When I first went to service, I thought it, you know, I thought I went, I went with, you know, the ignorance, we call it ignorance on fire. I was excited because I, I went because my sister invited me. But as I started to read the word and grow in reading the word, I realized that I went because the Holy Spirit drew me. And that same Holy Spirit that drew me, drew you here today. That's why you're here today. Can you give God honor and glory in the house of the Lord? And so before you are saved, it draws you. John 6, 30. Eight, I think it is, it says, no one can come to, Jesus said, no one can come to me unless first drawn by the Father. What does that mean? That means there's no way you come here if, if, if God isn't pulling you. Now, what happens is when you accept him, then that spirit that was pulling you starts to reside. Now, Paul explains what happened in verse six and uh, seven and eight here. He says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, that means when we were still in sin, Christ died for the ungodly. That means us. <laughs> Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good, for a good person, someone might possibly dare, die, dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. We'd done nothing wrong, nothing right. We hadn't stopped doing anything. We were still doing the wrong things, and God died for us. And so those who choose to believe, who deserve nothing, God gave us access to everything through Jesus because he loves us even in our ignorance. What does that mean? All of us in here have went in the wrong direction. All of us in here have done things wrong. All of us in here have rejected God. And that death on the cross, while, while it didn't make sense to us in the beginning, we ignored God all those years, it was for us. The act of us accepting Jesus as our Lord and Savior is proof that when he died on the cross, he was thinking about you. And so since, uh, verse 9, it says, since we have now been justified by his blood, meaning his death on the cross. And what does that mean? It means... Uh, the justify is to be made right. Justified means to uh, uh, to be made right. And so what does that mean? What does that mean? It means you, you by his death on the cross, it made you right before you knew it was making you right. How much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only, this, not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. We can now go before God in his holiest of holies as righteous because of Jesus Christ. It means you don't have to wonder if God is hearing you when you go into him with prayer. He always hears you because you're a child of God. You've accepted his son. That is the most righteous thing ever. And by accepting his son, you have been made righteous. He became sin that you will become the righteousness of God. He didn't become the, 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 the physical sin. He became the payment for sin so that you can become the righteousness. So when you go before God, you go before God as righteousness. And so we don't have to stress in the ignorance of our, our, our sin, but we can trust in the foundation of his righteousness. Those who go before the Lord can go before the Lord knowing that we're pure and we're clean. How many of you have felt 
condemned when you go before the Lord. You trusted in Jesus, but because of the things you've done wrong, you don't want to go to the Lord with it. You don't feel right. You, you feel bad when you go before the Lord. Uh, let me give you an example of that. Well, when you're in sin, you start to avoid things like church. You start to avoid the things of God. And so how many people in here with a show of hands have ever gotten to a point where you go before the Lord and you feel unclean, you feel unrighteous? Everybody's done that. Well, I'm here to tell you what the word says. The word says you are pure. You are clean, not because of anything you've done or everything you've done wrong, but because of everything Jesus has done. So you are made right through God. And it's an eternal change. Eternal. It's forever. There are no take back. Now, Paul, he explains how sin entered and will exit. This is how he clarifies it. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people because all sinned. Okay, okay. I need y'all to understand this. We can get to a point in our lives where we say, I don't believe. I don't believe I've sinned. Have you ever met that person? I've never done anything wrong. You know that? You're like, hey, next to me. No. <laughs> Has anybody ever said that? Have you ever seen somebody like this? Oh, man, I'm, I'm a good person. Well, if you're a good person and you've never done anything wrong, according to the scripture, according to the scripture, death entered through sin. Death entered through sin. So uh, how many people have in here ever said, well, I wonder why we die? Why do we die? Why does death happen? Why is all this travesty? Why are all these people killing people? Why is all these things happening? Why isn't God doing anything? How many of you have said that before? Amen. Where is God? Well, he makes it clear here. The reason we die is not because of God. The reason we die is because of sin. Do y'all understand that? God didn't create us to, to die. He created us to live eternally. But we, the, the death happens because we chose sin over God. So all that death we see happening is not because of God. It's because of who? Us. Sin. Yes. And so even in our sins, we blame God for death. How many people say, why do you have to die? Why did she have to die so early? Why did this happen? Anybody said that before? According to this scripture, the wages of sin, the payment for sin is death. We have to die because of sin. And death is the result of sin. I want you to write that down. Death is the result of sin. And so verse 13 and 14 here, it says, to be, to be sure sin was in the world before the law was given. How many people would have thought that because of the laws of Moses and the things we've done wrong, that's where death entered? No, that's not where death entered. It, it, death entered, it says death, uh, to, sin was in the world before the law was given. So all those laws of Moses, thou shall not do this, thou shall not do that, thou shall not do, all those laws of Moses, that, that, that didn't bring in sin. It says, but sin is not charged against anyone's account where there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to, Moses, to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command, as did Adam, who is the pattern of the one to come. So I want you to hear this clearly. We are made sinners not because of anything you've done, not because of anything your friend has done, not because of anything the people will do after us. We are made sinners because of Adam. Do you understand that? We are made sinners because of Adam, not because of our personal sin against the laws of God. Now, will our personal sin cause the, the same havoc? Yes, but our personal sin is not what made us sinners. Adam did. Everybody say Adam. Some of y'all, you can get to heaven. Where's Adam at? <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I used to joke about it. I was like, the first person I'm looking for is Adam. <laughs> Where you at, Adam? <laughs> uh, no. And so how, what's the evidence of sin? What's the evidence of death uh, and sin 
entering in through Adam. Well, the, 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 the evidence of that is where death entered. It, death didn't enter through Moses. Death entered through who? Adam. So where death entered, that's, guess what? That's where sin entered. The laws came hundreds of years later. All the laws did was identify sin. But sin came all the way through Adam. And so if a person tells you, well, I'm not, uh, I'm not, I'm not, I've never done anything wrong. I was like, okay, then you're not going to die, right? Because if they're going to die, that means sin entered that person. Everybody get it? Okay, so, so we can, so when we understand that, we understand that all the sins we have committed, which can cause problems uh, and, and, and condemn us, that's not the part that condemned us. It's when death entered that condemned us. And that was the sin of Adam. What does that mean? That means that death entered through Adam, sin entered through Adam, and it means that we can't fix something we didn't create. No matter how righteous you act, no matter how many things you do right, no matter how many people you give money to or take care of, you cannot fix it because the glass was broken with Adam. And you were born with that broken glass. And being that, I hope we're getting it now. So you can't fix it. There's no amount of righteousness that you can obtain that would make you right except fixing Adam. And so once we get that, once we understand that, that you can't fix it, that you're born a sinner and the evidence of it is death, you can say, I don't believe that. You can say whatever you want. Well, guess what? You still die. Why do we still die? Because of sin. And your belief doesn't change what happens to you. It says, verse 15, let's read this. 15, it says, but the, the, the gift is not like the trespass. For if, if the man died, if the many died by the trespass of one man, how much more did God's grace and the gift that came by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, overflow to the many. Nor can the gift of God be compared with the result of one man's sin. The judgment followed one sin. Do you hear that? The judgment didn't follow your sin. The judgment followed one sin. The judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. Your condemnation is not because of the things you've done wrong. It's not because of the things you've done right. It's because of the things that Adam did wrong. The condemnation. Wow. The, the, judgment, followed, uh, the judgment followed one sin and brought condemnation. But the gift followed many trespasses and brought justification. For if by the trespass of one man, death reigned through that one man, how much more those who receive God's ab uh, abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now, you, you don't have to understand all of this, but you have to know this. One sin, the sin of Adam, condemned us all that's what you need to know but the one sin increased to generations of multitudes of sin do you understand that i always give the example if you if you can picture a glass of coke right here and a half glass of water and if you pour the coke in the water the half glass of water and fill it to the top the coke is not going to look like the original glass What's it going to be? It's going to be diluted. And let's say you pour that. That's one generation. And you pour that into another glass of water. What happens? It dilutes more. After generation after generation, it gets so diluted, you can't see the Coke anymore. That's what happens. That's what sin does. Sin blinds you so much that when it gets down to generations, you can't see God. You don't know him. You don't even understand who he is. You deny him and he created you. See, I don't even know he existed. I don't know who this is. I don't, know, I don't know who this God thing is. That's what happened as the generations start to improve more multitudes of sins, of sins, of sins. It increases. 
And so one sin, the sin of Adam, condemned us all. But after that, we had a multitude of sins from generation to generation. And that's why you see how men used to live, uh, people used to live hundreds of years, how it just broke down because we started getting further and further away from God. So, and this is what it says. He said, but the, the, the sin, you know, the powerful thing is Adam had one sin and condemned us all, but one sin increased to generations of sin and the multitudes of sin. Jesus didn't have to save us from one sin. When he came, he had to save us from multitudes of sin. So he didn't have to do the easy work of, of just saving us from Adam's sin. He had to do the hard work of saving us from the billions and billions and billions of sins that have been committed. And when he died, he didn't die just for Adam's sin. He died for all of our sins, all the things we have done wrong so that we can be made righteous. He had to clear us of all the imperfections and all the things that made us uh, impure and make us right. Because we can't see God without that. And so Jesus saved us from the multitude of layers of rebellion of sins that followed Adam. And so our vision of God is tainted so much that we can't see him without help of the Holy Spirit. And so you understand that you can't save yourself. If God left you in the same condition, you're so clouded with sin, you would have avoided God. But the power of the Holy Spirit drew you to know God. That's why you should be thankful. That's why you should be praising God. That's why you should be thanking God. Every single day you wake up, every single day you breathe, no matter what's going on in your life, no matter what's going on in your challenges, you give honor and glory to God. Because he made you righteous. You can't make yourself righteous. Imagine being in the, the dirtiest pond where you can't see an inch in front of you. And what, what happens is our vision of God is so, so blinded where we, we're in that pond of sin where we can't see God. He has to first, in order for us to be made right, it is not a work that we do. It is a work that he does. He has to first clear you of everything else so that you could see his righteousness. And, and once you understand that, you understand, man, it was nothing me. It was all him. And you come to church because you love God, because you thank, you're thankful that you deserved hell, but he gave you heaven. Amen. Wow. Verse 18. Uh, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in the justification in life for all people. Amen. This is speaking from Adam to Jesus. I was reading in the commentary where it says, um, it says these were known as the two men who re represented all humanity. What does that mean? It means that one represented condom uh, the condemned, the other represents saved. And so when you look at this, you understand that there are two men here. There are two men that represent humanity. One man represents everybody else. You're either with Christ or you're with Adam. There is no in-between. One man, man represented everybody who, who's in sin, and the other represents salvation. And so you're either on one side or the other. Verse 19 says, for just as through the disobedience of one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of one man, many will be made righteous. Do y'all get this? You were born in sin through Adam. And, and, and you understand this thing. Every one of us is linked. We start to say, well, my generation, my family is from this. No, we're all linked. Every one of us is linked. And so what happens when we accept Jesus is we become linked again. We realize that we are truly brothers and sisters in Christ. And it's not based on race. It's not based on age. It's not based on anything else, but based on what Jesus has done for us. 
And we become literal brothers and sisters in Christ because we realize we have been linked and relinked through Jesus. Verse 20, the law was brought in so that the trespass might increase, but where sin increased, grace increased all the more. God's laws only exposed our true condition. It didn't make us sinners. We were made sinners through who? Adam. Does everybody get that? You think it's because of the things you've done wrong? No, it's because of the one sin he did wrong. That's where death came in. And so God's laws exposed us. And what is the evidence of sin entering? Death. Get it? So it wasn't brought in through Moses. It wasn't brought in through those Ten Commandments. It wasn't brought in the 613 laws. It wasn't brought in through the generations. It was brought in through Adam. And you can't fix that. That's why you need a savior. And it says where sin increased, grace increased all the more. God's grace to cleanse us is more powerful than sin's attempt to destroy us. <laughs> what is the example? The example is you are here today. That is the evidence that the, the, the power of God's grace is more powerful than the sin that is trying to destroy you. Can you give God honor and glory in his house this morning? You're like, Pastor, but I'm struggling. You, we all struggle. But God's grace is more powerful than the sin that is against you. Adam destroyed it through one sin, and then we had the multitude of sins. But God's grace is more powerful than the sin that's trying to destroy us. No matter how many times your past sin tries to tell you you're not right, that you're right, the grace of God tells you that Jesus is right. Your past sins will say, I'm not saved. You're not saved. Look at what you're doing. Look at what you've done. You still drink. You still have that addiction. You still have those challenges in your life. You still curse somebody out every once in a while. Is that true? You still do all those things wrong. You still scream at people. You still get mad. You still allow anger. Am I talking to the right people, the right crowd? Are y'all understanding what's going on here? That's what sin does. Sin tries to tell you that, but your Lord tells you, you are saved by the grace of God. You are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And once you understand that, you start to not listen to sin anymore. Yes, I made a mistake, but my Savior died for that. That's why it says where grace abound, where sin abound, grace abounds more. He, has, he knew what you were going to do when he got nailed to that cross. And he saved you from it. Verse 21, last verse. So that just as sin reigned in death, so also... Grace might reign through the righteous through righteousness to bring eternal life through those uh, through Jesus Christ our Lord. There is no other avenue to righteousness. There's no other avenue to forgiveness. You're not going to find God through Muhammad. You're not going to find him through Buddha. You're not going to find him through your own journey. You can only find him through Jesus. You're not going to find him through other religious practices. You're only going to find them through Jesus. You're not going to find them just through reading the Bible. You're going to find them through Jesus. The beginning from Genesis to Exodus to Leviticus all the way to Revelation is directing you to Jesus. The sacrifices, Jesus. Everything talks and directs you through to the Son of God. And he came down and he dwelt among us so that he can die, so that when you accept him, all the sins you have created or done wrong and will do wrong have been saved. They have been set, you have been set apart. And so this is a free gift that you have the opportunity to accept or deny. This is where we're at right now. We want you to understand that your decision is eternal. You may not understand it. I didn't understand it when I accepted him. But I just said, Lord, I, I don't know. I don't know what's going on, but, but I feel the need to accept you. I accept you. I know I've done wrong. I know I'm not right. But I know that you are right, and I accept you. And that changed my life. And I'm telling you now, 
that you have an opportunity. You don't want to get before God and not know his son. Because the scripture says who the son sets free is free indeed. And so you either want eternal life through Jesus or you want eternal death through Adam. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10 says this. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Did you hear me? That's, all, that's what it says. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, made right, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. This is your opportunity to profess your faith. This is your opportunity to accept the Lord. This is your opportunity to know God. You don't have to understand it all, but you have to know that the first thing is confessing it and believing that he is who he says he is. Can I get an amen in the house of the Lord? Amen. And so this is what we want to do. I want you to stand in the presence of God this morning because the Bible says where two or more gathered, here he is. So he's present this morning. I want you all to understand that he's present and he's here this morning. And I, I, I want you to understand it and know uh, what we're about to do this morning. Because what I want to do, I don't want anybody to leave here without knowing that you know God. You can walk out the door and something could happen to you. But I want you to know, just like the thief on the cross, all it takes is faith. Faith in God. And so what we're going to do, I, wanna, I want us to stand in the presence of God. And what we're going to do is we're going to... Uh, say a prayer and give the opportunity for those who want to know Jesus. First, we'll ask, we'll ask that you, you, you repeat a prayer after, after, uh, after me. And then those who want to uh, profess that they have accepted the Lord, if you want to let us know, um, then we want you to let us know. I want everybody to close their eyes. I want you to, if you could, grab hands with the person next to you. I want you to repeat after me if you, if you believe. I want you to repeat after me. Say, Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus come, into my heart. come into my heart. Make me a new creation. Let my old ways pass away and let all things become new. I believe that you gave your life on the cross to save my life through the cross. And by your wounds, I am healed from the confines of death. Permit me to be your disciple. And abide, by the name of Jesus. and abide by the name of Jesus until my last day on earth. Until my last day on earth. Today, I believe Today I believe that by your blood, by your blood I, am truly saved. I am truly saved. In the name of Jesus, name of Jesus. give God a round of applause in the house of the Lord.